Are population and demography the key to understanding politics? Can the right immigration policy foster social harmony? And what's the future for white majorities in the West? If you're interested in these questions, then the person to consult is my guest today. Eric Kaufman is Professor of Politics at Birkbeck College, University of London, and is author of many books and articles on these and related topics. So, Eric, welcome. Great to be here, Will. Great, thank you. Um, so all of a sudden, uh, politics seems to be dominated, doesn't it, by questions of ethnicity and culture and identity. So the first question, very broad one, how did we get here in terms of the demographics? Well, really, we're going, the world is going through uh, a demographic transition, of course, from high, high birth rates and death rates to low birth rates and death rates. Uh, the place that got there first is the West, and what happened was then the birth rates sort of fell below the death rate, so we don't have replacement fertility. Um, and what that means is it accelerates the rate of change brought in by immigration. And so really, all the world's population growth now is in the developing world, pretty much. Um, and so this is the source of migration, and of course, long distance migration. There's always been a certain amount of, of migration, but it's really the long distance migration that's increased dramatically since about 1950. Uh, and that's really reshaping Western societies like Britain. Yes, I think that's right. So if you, if you, if you have a sort of three-line description of where we are in modern politics in Britain and the States and so on, the three lines, I'd say, might be mass migration, very, very substantial ethnic change, and then, and then populist backlash. And you might add a more recent uh, sort of liberal backlash to the populist backlash. Would that be a sort of very crude but accurate way of... Uh, yeah, I think so. I think we are into a, a new politics that is, called, you know, related to this decline of white majorities across the West, and, and a decline which has been substantial because, you know, the U.S. in 1960 was sort of 85% non-Hispanic white, and by 2050 it'll be 50%. And an even more dramatic example is my own country, Canada, where, you know, from roughly 80% European origin in, in 2006, the projections from Statistics Canada demographers would put it at around the reverse 20% uh, European or, or thereabouts in, uh, the, in 2106. So that kind of gives you a sense of the speed of the change in some countries. It's not going to be that quick here in Britain or in Europe, but that's the backdrop against which um, cultural issues around migration are increasing in prominence, reordering electoral maps. We can see that with the membership of the Conservative and Labour parties here, uh, but, but also across the US and Europe. Yeah, so it changes everything. And I think uh, a point which comes out, firstly, is the scale uh, of migration has been, been huge. Um, Paul Morland, a, a fellow um, demographer, produced a book a couple of years ago. Uh, and a line that jumped out of that book was that the, um, the actual amount, the quantum of immigration, say, into Britain, at the peak, in the peak years of the new Labour, uh, expansion and immigration in one year was larger than the total from uh, 1066 to 1900. Right. So it's a quite, a, I mean, it was a staggering thing, which if it's right, it just shows you the scale. And I suppose that gets on to uh, the question of, of change. And in, a, in the city that we're speaking from today, London, it's, it's, it's changed hugely. Um, so another question sort of related to that, um, it's progress of a type because it's happened, but uh, is it fair to say that some people would look at it uh, and say, actually, that change represents some sort of loss to me culturally? Yeah, so I mean, definitely what you see is in the population, you know, one group of the population sees change as loss, sees difference as disorder. And another group maybe sees, ch either doesn't mind or sees change as stimulating. And that's becoming the, the and actually that divide is 50% heritable. Jonathan not Jonathan Haidt, but Pew did, a, did some twin study uh, on this, and it's basically highly heritable. Um, and Jonathan Haidt shows this too in terms of how you perceive dots on a screen. Mm. Something as abstract as that. So this division between the people who like diversity and change at a faster rate and those who want it at a slower rate mm. is becoming key to Western politics. Yeah, you could see it as division between freedom and security, couldn't you? And then, and that, as you say, Haidt's uh, and, and other data backs up the idea that by disposition, some people are just naturally more, slightly more conservative. And, and those people would think huge change, but I'm not sure I'm really comfortable with that. Yeah, so when there isn't much change going on, I think these differences remain latent and other differences around class, for example, can, and, and can be more prominent. 
Uh, but when you're in an atmosphere of, of difference and change increasing quickly, then these sorts of psychological differences rise to the surface and now increasingly structure the way people vote. So absolutely, this is a, uh, I think it marks, you know, you, could, you can look for historical analogies. You can see that in Scotland, which did receive more immigration, say, than England in many places, given the Irish migration there, that the Protestant Catholic issue uh, was very important for politics for quite a while. Mm. And so many working class Scots voted conservative um, because they were Protestant, for example. And, you know, so that, that sort of, and Northern Ireland is as, as an extreme of that where there isn't really the left right and it's much more about which community you belong to. Mm. But, but that's just to say that politics sometimes is about culture and sometimes it's about the economic divide and we're moving towards, I think, these cultural divisions more. Dominating it, yeah. yeah. No, I think that's right. I think that's probably you can see that everywhere now. I think, um, and you you mentioned the Irish question is interesting in, in Scotland, west of Scotland, because as you say, uh, as recently as the fifties, you had very very large uh, constituency number of constituencies in Strathclyde that were conservative because they were unionist. But that was partly sort of yeah uh, reflected in, in the ethnicity, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, and and in Liverpool you saw that locally, you know. Um, but yeah, this is this is where you can get these. Divisions that, that violated the, the old, you know, left economic, left right, labor, Tory equation that held in in Britain so, or England so strongly uh, post war. So we're we're a very very diverse society now. So um, the one of the main uh, aims of politics must therefore be a sort of a quest for uh, common ground and, and peace among very very different groups. Would you agree that that's a, that's a fundamental aim now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so I think, and I think this is where, but of course it raises questions around what racism means. You know, you have one side that is trying to expand the meaning of it to say that, you know, if you want to reduce immigration, that's racism, right? So, so in uh, trying to deal with diversity, it then throws up the second order problems, which, which separate your progressive left liberals from your conservatives around, well, no, it's legitimate to have a conversation about how fast we want to change versus, no, that's illegitimate, that's terrible. Uh, so it's the second kind of moral clash, which is overlaid on and thrown up by the sort of demographic cultural clash. Yeah, um, we, I mean, when, when we're looking, when we've looked at it as a party, what, what are the sort of foundations, what are the preconditions for getting along? Uh, one, a very important one for us is, is what we call civilized toleration, which originally sort of uh, something that John Gray wrote about, actually, um, which is to have uh, a degree of toleration for differences, because there will be differences, and we've got to negotiate them. And the idea that you get strict proportionality in every single domain, I think, is uh, unrealistic, given the, the fact that people make different choices. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I, that's right. I think that, I mean, if you're talking about the equality debate, this, this is driven too much by uh, gap, gap-based thinking, oh, there's a, a gender gap, a race gap, there must be racism. Um, now, there could be, but a sort of sophisticated approach would be to say, well, controlling for the pipeline of applicants uh, is their bias, controlling for you know, people's merit and aptitude and, and interest in, in different things and their, their education and class background, is there still a bias? That's a kind of, that would be a scientific way of doing it as opposed to, oh my God, there's a gap, this is shameful. So yeah, I think we've been, too much of the discourse has been too, that overgeneralized sweeping narrative and not enough on saying, let's be targeted, let's focus on rigorous gaps that survive attempts at falsification from competing theories that more scientific approach, I think, needs to replace the kind of maximalist approach we've seen. Yeah, yeah so you're, you're, what you're saying there is basically any, if you view any disparity as, as evidence, direct evidence of re direct prejudice and racism, then you're, you're making a mistake, actually. Yeah, exactly. And, and it can actually even work the other way. It may be that maybe um, Hindu Indians are, are earning more money than whites, but maybe they should be earning even more money. So maybe there is discrimination against them at the highest levels, or maybe there isn't, but the only way to know that, and equally on the other end, if, if a group is underperforming, it may not be evidence of discrimination. So, you know, I think this is where, and I don't, people aren't asking these questions about, you know, why do Jews earn more money than Christians? You know, so clearly there are only certain questions that are getting a lot of the attention. Um, what is necessary, I think, in all of this is a sort of scientific approach that 
sort of controls for confounding variables and deals with counter arguments. And we're not we're not even remotely there. Anymore. We're not well. We're not <laughs> certainly not even remotely there because because of course the questions only get asked uh, in certain domains. And uh, you know, so no, very few people say, well, why are uh, black people overrepresented in the premiership? Maybe cultural, you know, right. uh, uh, may, may not be. Um, why are what white working class boys underperforming in education? Rarely gets brought up. So it's only a certain area, isn't it? Um, one of the other things that I think we're, we, we sort of take um, as a sort of precondition for getting along in a diverse society is, is some sort of common uh, culture that can bind us together. That seems to be a, a, a major um, uh, aim. It, we must try and do this somehow. So that, how, would you, how would you go about that in, in a very, very diverse, an increasingly diverse society? Well, I, I have this concept of multivocalism, which is not multiculturalism, but which sort of says, well, you know, we need to have common symbols like, like in this country, say, the Union Jack or, or you know, a, a common history. But clearly, you know, people from different class and age and, and ethnic backgrounds are going to forge their ties somewhat differently to somewhat different symbols. And so it may be that... You know, we know from the BBC survey of Englishness that you know, white British people have a higher, their Englishness is, is somewhat more attached to countryside, for example, than ethnic minorities, although 50% of minorities are also attached to countryside. You know, it doesn't have to be the case that white British and minorities identify to Britain equally through the countryside. It may be that minority Britons identify more with you know, the NHS or with diversity or whatever. They, it would, whatever. Uh, you have to allow that flexibility though. So if someone wants to identify their Britishness through the countryside and even through many generations ancestry in Britain, that's fine. It does, as long as they're not saying this is the only way to be British. So allowing a kind of, it's like a menu, having people pick off a menu. It is a menu, it's not endless. Um, but you're not sort of stigmatizing people who choose certain things and other things. Right? Yeah, I think, I think there, are, there are serious possibilities in that. Um, but also I think that demonstrates that is that the, um, the level of patriotism among uh, some of our immigrant groups is much higher than some of our progressive liberal white groups. I mean, obviously, I mean, I'd sooner be in a ditch with them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it proves the point. Yeah, yeah. And, and, all, and you have also, yeah, and of course, you can see this I think it's even more pronounced in the U.S., uh, but you also see it here where minorities will have an identity with what the radicals might call white history. They will be attached to you know, figures like Churchill and so on. Mm -hmm. not, maybe not so much Churchill as, as other figures, but still. Um, and that is part of their patriotic identity. And, and, so, and that's very hard to, to grasp. I mean, one of the, the surprises, of course, in the U.S. election was the Hispanic and Asian and to some extent African-American increase in vote for Trump. And, and if you look at the survey data on this, I mean, it's tied very much to similar themes to, to why white voters voted for Trump. So it's not the case that minorities are voting for Trump out of pure economic self-interest or religious interest or whatever, that, that they're buying into this national narrative mythos. of national... Yeah, yeah of, of what, what, what America is, yeah. And they, and they, yeah. they have as much uh, desire to, to retain and protect that as anyone else. That's right, yeah, and this is where I think on, you know, you can look at immigration as, as a litmus of that, and, and you know, a lot of minority Trump voters, you know, the overwhelming majority would support things like building a wall, things like deportation, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and part of that is, is, is that they are attached to the country they know, grow, grow, knew growing up and mm -hmm. so forth. They don't want to see that change as rapidly. And so it's a very similar kind of impulse. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, this is not a kind of racially exclusive. Uh, but it's still, I mean, you can read, you can read optimists on, on sort of national mythos and, and culturally binding central, you know, common cultures. You can read pessimists. Um, and I, but it's, we certainly need to be uh, aware of it. We need to try and foster it and build it because, um, I mean, it, it, thinkers like Oakeshott and certainly John Gray would, would argue probably with some force that you can't do without it. I mean, you, you, you know, you can't, Gray has described um, the United States as functioning like, a, you know, in a sort of low grade civil war, uh, low intensity civil war. And in a sense, that's right. If you, if you fail to, to bring people together, you've got, I mean, in, in an, an indifference to bringing people together, I think is a problem. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think especially when you don't Increasingly, we don't have the Cold War. We don't have pressures on the boundaries, people trying to invade us. Some of the things which might have served to glue 
people together in the past no longer exist. So we, I think, have to develop a, a nationalism that works in peacetime, if you like. Mm. Uh, and I suppose I'm kind of gravitating to this view of where you allow people to you know, identify differently to the same place, yeah. to the same symbols. So you're not telling people, you know, this is the Declaration of the Rights of Man, you must, you know, recite this pledge or whatever, and this is the only way to be American or French or whatever. The, that you would allow variation in the journey to how you get there. But what you wouldn't stand for as much is this sort of overt criticism and oppositional kind of narrative of your history is awful and racist. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and so that's the kind of thing I think needs to be dialed down so that, you know, you allow for different forms of, say, British identity, but that includes that more kind of uh, people that, that identify on the basis of the countryside, on the basis of the history and the ancestry, and not necessarily on the basis of futuristic achievements or uh, the NHS or whatever, or diversity or whatever. So you actually are t more tolerant of a view of the country that maybe is based on similarities with the past and not differences from the past. Yeah, I mean, in, in White Shift, you're a little bit pessimistic, I think, about the... Um, the success of, of what we would call civic nationalism, and we, you know, as a civic nationalist party, we, we that's basically the, the the peg that our coat is hung on, because we believe that um, the, just the, the basic idea that we're in it together and we owe a duty to fellow citizens, and that's primary, or what we would call national citizen preference, cuts across any community. And I think I, I, I'm still would. Uh, I mean, it's been, it's been difficult in the present times to argue for that, but that's still what we believe in. I think it has great merit. No, I agree if you, if you define it that way in terms of uh, the idea of a common good and, and citizen preference. Uh, but I think that it's not, you know, clearly there were attempts to talk about civic nationalism and British values and things by Gordon Brown and, 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 and others. And I think they didn't quite address, they can, this sort of thing can't really quite address the problems thrown up by large-scale migration and diversity, that there is also, that part of national identity is, is, is what's called everyday nationalism. It is the countless things, such as the countryside, but also uh, drinking tea and, and football and all of these sort of vernacular forms. Now, one of those things might be the countryside, it might be accents, but it also might be ethnic composition. That's not frozen in time, mm -hmm. but it's to say that rapid shifting in that is going to unsettle a certain version of national identity. And so all I'm saying is that, no, some people, for some people that might not matter at all. For other people, it might matter, including ethnic minorities might be attached to a particular, yeah. just as some whites are attached to diversity as a feature of Britain, mm. ethnic minorities, some of them are attached to the idea of a white majority mm. alongside minorities as a feature of Britain. And so we have to respect both, I think. And that's where the big problem is. I think we can't, there isn't respect for these two versions. Yeah, I just think the, you mentioned the politicians that have tried it. I just think it's thin gruel because they were insufficiently um, patriotic in the in their broad outlook. I mean, I think, you you know, Brown, yeah, he's, he's okay, but he, you know, pretty weak on, on self-governance and the Euro and things. And he, although he actually, on a, on a particular point, it, without Brown and Balls, he probably would be in the Euro now, so the whole history would be different, but insufficiently patriotic, I would say. Um, and, and that's why it's thin grill. I think the, the sense, certainly, you know, post Brexit, uh, an Ireland uh, trying to, to forge its way in the world, we're in it together. You know, I think that's the message. Can I move on to immigration? Because another, yeah. another um, uh, precondition, I think, an obvious precondition to uh, 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 social harmony is to regulate immigration correctly. Um, and uh, that's why at the, at the start I sort of mentioned its link to, I think, um, uh, social harmony because obviously you, you on one side you've got you know some open border zealots that we, we call them who who would basically want no controls at all uh, and then on the other hand you have people wanting to slam the, the brakes on and, and close completely and no sensible party is going to do that but you've got to probably ha we would argue for lower immigration and an, an idea that we've we've floated all it isn't policy yet is uh, a mass immigration pause so I think we've got uh, Gross immigration, 750, you know, three quarters of a million people is huge. Um, net immigration, over a third of a million, many for most years. It, we think that's just too too high. Uh, and I think if you're going to have a, a, a lower immigration level, it would be wise to sustain it. So do you think a, an idea 
of a pause is a good one? And do you think it has a successful historical precedent? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it depends what you mean by a pause. And, but I think, you know, the, the, the population here, if you, if you look at surveys, the number that they're comfortable with is maybe around 100 uh, net, 100,000 a year, uh, which might be sensible. Um, and if you, if you look at, yeah, I mean, you can look at um, other places. In North America, the immigration history of North America is one of, uh, you know, periods of large-scale migration followed by periods of pauses, the most famous of which is the U.S. between 1924 and 1965, yeah. during which time um, a lot of the steam went out of the, the sort of restrictionist movement, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the divisions that plagued the country uh, actually started to heal. I mean, Robert Putnam talks a little bit about this in his recent book, although he ignores immigration. But um, yeah, I think it was important in many ways for helping the Catholic and Jewish immigrants sort of begin to assimilate, uh, set the stage for a lowering of the temperature uh, in this department and, and had many positive effects. So yeah, I think I would agree with you. Um, yeah. you, know. you you're so if, you, if your aim is integration and assimilation, then actually the rate of immigration is interlinked with that, isn't it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Because the, I mean, I really the assimilation is ultimately going to be about ethnic assimilation and intermarriage. That's really the only thing that really, really, really sort of erodes these fundamental electoral divisions. Um, and I think that takes it takes multiple generations, two or three generations for that process to happen. Once it starts to happen, it then happens really quickly. But during the period, it takes a while. It's one of these gestating things. And so you do need to, to give a pause to, to, for this process to occur. And by the way, state-led integration efforts generally have not been shown to be effective. I mean, we haven't seen much evidence that states can really accelerate that. Uh, yeah. If anything, they can do a lot of bad things. So in a way, this is really down to sort of private social behavior, which does take time to bed down. Yeah, and no, I agree with that. I think that's, that's very, very well put. Um, I think uh, indifference to integration has been a problem. Uh, there's a great line in, in uh, David Goodhart's Road of Somewhere where he talks about the prom politically on the, on the left and, uh, and summarizes it by saying the left basically were, were, were too, on mass immigration, too enthusiastic and on uh, integration too indifferent. And I think that's right. I and mean, there is a there is a, a a chance for a society to catch its breath. Um, and we obviously we talk a lot about uh, liberal overreach. And I would argue that if you really really care about race relations, the social harmony in the UK, uh, lower immigration is probably the answer in the next five ten years. To just to give people a break, actually, to say, okay, well, we've had a lot of change. Would it be a good idea to, to, to get, you might even call it, if you're taking a different tack, to call it a, uh, an integration pause, mm. you know, something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think what's happened, of course, on the left is, is ideologically, there's been a shift since the 60s towards what I call left modernism. And, and, and what left modernism is, is a kind of a, a cultural, culturally, it's less about class, more about identity. Uh, and this modernism uh, is, is, an, is a heritage of the Bohemian enclaves going back to the early 20th century. And what the ideology of modernism is really about is diversity and change as a good in and of itself. And so that is now very much integral to uh, the, the left, that left modernist vision. And so clearly anything that goes against more change and diversity on the culture side is going to be viewed very negatively. And, and we're kind of seeing that ideology coming up to its peak. I don't think that's appreciated enough in these debates. This ideology is reaching a peak of its influence in society. And this is one of the reasons this conversation, which I agree with you, it makes that, that is the right thing for harmony. But ideologically, this is, is, this is doing all the running on the left. We do, yeah, but we do have uh, one thing in our support is that actually in the hinterland, if you look at data, then there's a lot of support for this. Actually, it's only it's it is as you we we have a different word for them, uh, not left modern, modernists. We, right. we we actually call them uh, sort of liberal progressives, but it's the same it's the same uh, sort of origin intellectually, isn't it? Um, and I think there is a misalignment between what they think and what everyone else thinks, and that's so you know I think as a political project you need to try and represent um, a sort of decent populist. Uh, hinterland and, and just to just to give them a voice actually apart from anything else because the dominance actually uh in the institutions of, of what you call the uh left modernist approach is is almost hegemony isn't it it is it is and and you know you can see that most in the universities which i've looked at where it's about 
uh, and certainly in the social sciences and humanities, it's about a nine or 10 to one uh, ratio between conservatives and, and, and the left, for example. Uh, in the US, it's more like 14 to one. So yeah, I mean, this is, this is a huge skew, and it's, it's there to a, to a somewhat lesser extent in, in other kind of cultural industries. Um, and that's setting the tone, but it's also impacting through education and through celebrity culture and Hollywood and everything, the sensibility of younger people. And, and so actually, the group who adhere to left modernism is growing, and it is actually much larger. You know, this, the more in common report suggests 13% of the British population are what they would call progressive activists. Mm. So 13%, you know, it's not, it's obviously a minority, but it's still a significant number of people, right? And, and they That's are quite huge. influential. Yeah, I mean, I, you, you said you, we might be reaching a sort of peak of this type of thinking, but given the fact that it's, um, it's run right the way through all the institutions, so from education, it's like a sort of um, a pipeline into the institutions, then, and then the institutions don't really have very much uh, viewpoint diversity on this. Um, are, you, are you confident it is a peak? I mean, I think, could it, couldn't it get worse? Oh, I think it will get worse. I mean, you, if you look, for example, at attitudes amongst academics uh, towards, say, dismissing academics with controversial views, um, you know, there's a much higher propensity amongst younger academics to be in favor of this, even if you control for ideology. So a left-wing so a 65-year-old left-winger and you compare them to a 30-year-old left-winger, the 30-year-old left-winger is much more into cancel culture than the 65-year-old left-winger. And less keen on democracy. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I suppose, yeah, I mean, exactly. So, so there is this, and I think it is gonna get more intense because the new cohorts coming in embody this more politically intolerant, le illiberal version of left modernism where, and, and the kind of willingness to discriminate for example, this study in the U.S. showed that six in ten uh, Republicans with a master's or PhD <clears throat> said they they were fearful of their career if their views became known to their colleagues. Well, um, that's because that's yeah. because the, their colleagues think that they don't just disagree with them; they think they're evil. <laughs> that's, well, that's, that's right. That's yeah. been the, that's been essentially the problem. And, and, and John Hyatt and, and others have said, well, the again, the solution got to be a solution to this. The solution is to try and mobilize. The, uh, the, the undergraduates in the room, 60% don't agree with this. I mean, most, what do you go to university for? Um, I want to talk to you about universities, but, the, right. but just before we, <laughs> before we do that, uh, I just wanted to, to talk about the BLM cultural moment, which um, has, been, has been absolutely huge. Now, as a, as a personal question, the, the, this must have been like three buses coming in a row for you, because, <laughs> because all of a sudden, having studied this and... and yeah. uh, tackled it, then you get this, this unusual situation with the pandemic and then you get a lockdown and then you get this, this worldwide sort of moral panic overnight and Aris Rusinos commented, I think correctly, that to, to be in that moment and to speak English uh, across the Anglosphere was to be instantly infected by this US-style hyperracialism. It was just imported overnight. So that must have been an incredible position for you to, to witness it. Yeah, no, it, it was a fascinating phenomenon, although really, you know, in many ways unsurprising that the kind of uh, moral power that this racist discourse has, and, and has, has been increasing in magnitude. I mean, if you look at mention, use of the word racist in, in the New York Times and in other newspapers, I mean, after sort of 2014-15, you just see this spike. Um, what Matthew Iglesias at Vox, formerly of Vox, he's now left, um, it calls the Great Awakening. Uh, amongst white uh, liberal Americans, but that sort of that sensibility is spread because partly I think there isn't a moral language to combat this. That that it's a bit like being in a in a Christian society and a fundamentalist coming along and says, well, it says here in the Bible that you 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 know you shouldn't drink and dance or whatever. And and there's just no argument to that since everyone's signed up. So when you get these ideologically homogenous environments, to some degree, universities, if someone comes in with a crazy kind of argument, you know, that picture is racist, whatever the picture is, then it's very hard for anybody to sort of talk back against that because the moral high ground is held by the person who, who exemplifies the common values. Yes, it's, it's, been a, it's been a really interesting moment from that point of view. Um, but it's, it's slightly, on the data, I think it's slightly puzzling in that the point that uh, John McWhorter makes that is that actually on the data, you know, we've had the 64 Act in the States and the 68 Act and... Uh, we've, we've achieved huge progress, and McWhorter says, well, um, 
actually, in fact, uh, there's never been a better time to be black in, in the States. But that's, but, 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 but there seems to be a, a huge impetus just to ignore that, that and, and portray it as not the case. Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a number of facets to this. I mean, and I think Alexis de Tocqueville makes this statement that, you know, the more you manage to achieve an equal society, the remaining inequalities stand out even more and, and people get more worked up. Um, there's also a common phenomenon, you know, something like crime rates in the United States have been dropping for 20 years, let's say 20, 25 years, pretty consistently. And all but two years, people have been said, saying crime is rising over mm. last year. Mm. So you have this kind of innumeracy about things people care a lot about, and, and race is one of them. And I've got a, a study coming out or a report coming out, which will point out some of the unbelievable factual beliefs that people actually hold, uh, simply because the media has been pumping this uh, a lot, and and so as some, as a problem gets smaller and smaller, mm -hmm. people will focus and inflate whatever is there more and more. And actually, there have been studies. So one study, sh I think, was was talking about uh, f showing people different faces and which ones are honest or dishonest. And, and it, I think it was removing the dishonest, or maybe it was um, the case, the dishonest cases of fraud or whatever. And they were removing them, and people were still reporting the same share of dishonest people because they kind of felt the need to do that, right? Yeah, I think, I, think, I mean, I, 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 I'd say first off, I think the BLM and, and, the, and the, the importing, the, the style of politics in the UK is very unhelpful. And it's, it's, it's been depressing for people, you know, for people like us who argue for, I, I guess, which, which now seem quite old fashioned ideas, like, you know, a colorblind approach, or even, even to, to aim at a post-racial approach, which is right. what, what we're trying to do. Um, I think this has just put back the whole cause, and I think it's been very divisive and um, uh, polarizing. Yes. And uh, so it's not been helpful. But an interesting aspect of it is is, is how um, the people that are promoting and agitating, and including the press, and a, a lot of the press have, have jumped onto this, without any sort of critical faculties and, and without any looking at the data. I mean, it, 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 it does, BLM as a project, as a political project, has not been judged you talk in, in White Shift a lot about asymmetry, asymmetries in, in racism. And I, I think a, a main problem has been that we haven't been able to judge BLM as we would judge any other political project. Right. So, we, you know, so we ignore you know, the fact that you know, it's anti-family and it's, you know, it's, it has Marxist roots. And we just ignore all the things that it says on that. And, and so well, it's because the broad aim is okay, but you wouldn't judge any other political movement like that, would you? No, no, and, and it's because it gets to what McWhorter calls the religion of anti-racism, so that if a group is a totemic group in the religion, then criticizing it is like criticizing Jesus if you're yeah. a Christian. I mean, you can't do it, and so, uh, and cloaking yourself in, in a slogan, I mean, who could say black lives don't matter, right? I mean, yeah. of course, it's that Martin Bailey approach is behind that the slogan no one can disagree with is a whole bunch of objectionable stuff. And, it's a masterpiece and, yeah, yeah. of political advertising. Well, it's like Antifa, right? Who could, you know, are you saying you're a fascist? How can you not be anti-fascist, right? So it's a, it's a similar strategy, but um, I think it, it points to this expansion of the definition, and, and, and you see this among, say, religious fundamentalism as well, where you know you see signs of the devil everywhere or signs of God everywhere. I mean, this is sort of something quite similar. Yeah. Um, and But of course, there's also a neglect of the downside, you know, the fact, okay, so you had these, these protests and riots, the police withdrew, and now you've got an enormous number of black people being killed, which no one cares about, which is, I think, Glenn Lowry's point, that yeah. you're trying to help these people, right? So are we going to have a, do a proper accounting of... of the but it's the asymmetry, uh, Eric, it's the asymmetry. That's, that's what's so stark in it. And Coleman Hughes has been on this as well, about, about the press coverage bias. So... You know, we, we have a national broadcaster here, which has in its charter, it's paid for. It doesn't have to be biased. I mean, it is biased. Right. Right. It doesn't have to be. I mean, it's not, it's not being paid for by commercial interests saying hammer this, hammer that. Um, and, and they have a, this fact checker uh, who's paid, you know, a reasonable amount of money, I'm sure. And he's never, it, during the, the peak of the BLM uh, movement in the UK, he never, there was no BBC piece on, on the racial disparity in police shootings in, in the US. And the fact that there isn't really a disparity. I mean, R.G. Fryer's, Harvard report sort right. of pretty much proves that there isn't. I mean, there are lots of other problems in policing in the States, and there's, there's a need for reform, and there's, there are some shining examples, uh, you know, in uh, New Jersey and so on, where you can get it right. So it's not to say there weren't issues, but on that major thing, it was never fact checked. And, and I think the irresponsibility is to let that sort of let that meme fly 
And, and then, as you say, just completely ignore, not report 24 deaths by shootings in Chicago in a weekend. Well, exactly. I mean, this is, this is the remarkable thing. And, and, and the, you know, he, for example, one of the things that you will notice is that the people's beliefs about the number of uh, young black people that are shot by police, I mean, are wildly out of touch with reality if you look at survey evidence. Um, and that's so, so here we have kind of essentially fake news and misinformation going on that's believed in an uncritical way. Now, I mean, you know, and, and I'm not saying that, you know, obviously the right does it too, this idea of the election being stolen or whatever, yeah. um, but, but clearly it's an asymmetry on how you're treating these two things based on the holiness, perceived holiness of anything around race and to some extent gender and sexuality. So how, how we as a society take on this holiness, the dominance of this sort of left modernist religiosity, because even kind of more reasonable people will be reluctant to stand up to this, and I've seen this in university committee meetings, and everyone knows this stuff's crazy, but no one's going to stand up to it because then you look like you're, you know, conservative or even worse, or racist, which puts Alt you in right. the outgroup. Yes, yes. yes. Right. So, <laughs> right, yeah. so it's not just that, that there's a penetration in these elite institutions of people with this set of views, but it is the, you know, it's the force multiplier of the taboo. It is a taboo. Yeah, so, it, it, so, yeah. it, it, it is, and it's, it's certainly when we argue for lower immigration primarily, I mean, the three main headings on, on our case for lower immigration are certainly centre-left headings. So, you know, we, we, I, I mean, I think there's been a... We, it's economic, so you can, it's, you know, you're in the realm of a, 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 a fragmented discipline, to put it mildly. But, but we think on immigration, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the Europeans' labour market, European wide labour markets, had a, a downward uh, effect on wage rates. Uh, just a, a basic view on supply and demand should should tell you that. We think it's uh, discouraged uh, domestic training and uh, skills training, which again you don't have to train anyone if you can just import people like like econs. You know, it's just 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 you know dehumanises people actually. You, you don't. There's no idea that you should train your own population. Just just buy it in. And then the, the whole point about solidarity, you know, the, the, what we used to call the social contract, you know, just, just I think very large uh, immigration threatens that. I would say they're all left of center ideas, but if you, if you, if you say, uh, well, we should have slightly more moderated immigration, you are immediately alt-right probably. Right, <laughs> right, yeah. But, yeah. but that's, you know, it's kind of an example where um, a lot of people say, oh, well, political correctness is just an issue on campus. It doesn't really matter. But actually, when you look at its downstream effects, so if it shuts down a conversation on immigration and the main parties aren't able to touch it, which especially in continental Europe or in the U.S. Uh, prior to Trump, then that opens the space for populists, for example. You wouldn't have pop, you know, right-wing populism if you, if you had the mainstream parties dealing with this. So now you've got populism, you've got polarization. You know, if you can't talk about Rotherham, well, Tommy Robinson now has an opportunity to pop. So we do talk it? about Rotherham. We do, but you've got to be brave to talk about it. Sure. You have to. I mean, it's not. I mean, it's such a difficult. That that particular issue right. is such a difficult issue. I mean, I think there's a very strong case to say the girls that were um, abused there, the abuse is partly racially motivated. I think there's a there's a there's a reasonable case to to say that on the evidence, but. Um, you know, yeah, if, if, if mainstream politicians won't talk about it, then it is left to the likes of others. Yeah. I mean, you know. they can talk about it sensitively and say, well, you know, clearly this is not a, a verdict on uh, Pakistani Muslims. This is like a tiny group of people. You, you can say it in, in a way that, you know, Trump doesn't. You know, you can say it in a sort of more uh, appropriate way. But I think just to, to deal with that or even issues around, say, the, you know, family issues and, and, and whether one parent or two parent, does that matter for kids being right you know all of these sorts of issues are much much more difficult to talk about when you've got these taboos which they are getting are, in the but, way but again it Eric, stores we, up a time bomb we try and, yeah i'm an yeah, the family you know, I, I, I speak a lot I, I i i try and raise it as many times as i can because i think as a, a foundation of society it's there and the data's in there it's not it is a um you know a, a key a key foundation of society and you know it shouldn't be uh, controversial to say that lad, lads need dads. It shouldn't be, but but it is. I agree. Uh, as to as to whether we're um, headed uh, in the right direction, there is there is a, a ray of light. Very recently, wasn't there? At Cambridge University recently on freedom of speech, 
Um, and c could you tell us something about what happened there? That was interesting. Well, I mean, this is the good work uh, of Arif Ahmed, who's uh, an academic at Cambridge who organized uh, this photo. And really what, what Cambridge were trying to do was, was shift the definition of, uh, you know, that you actually had to respect quote unquote, respect the identities and views of others and not just tolerate them, which would basically mean that anybody could say, well, um, you know, you're making an argument for lower immigration, so you're, you're actually making me feel unsafe and disrespecting me in some way as, as a person of color. Or, you know, people would be able to concoct arguments on the trans issue or whatever, or on the, on the Israel-Palestine issue, uh, and, and essentially bring up hurt feelings as a way to shut down debate. And, and that is sort of what's behind the no platforming and behind a lot of the uh, open letter campaigns to dismiss academics and all of this sort of illiberalism that has been growing since in this country probably about 2017 in, in, in a serious way. Uh, and that was soundly rejected, you know, I think by a margin of something like, you know, 80, 85 percent of, of 1,500 senior academics uh, or largely senior uh, rejected this. And so that's a big blow to the activists and appliant leadership that's gone along with the activists uh, who've been pushing this agenda. And it kind of gets to where, you know, you have this pressure group that's highly motivated and organized and, and works the taboos. So they sort of uh, bet on the fact that other people are going to be silent because they, they go to They find the most, um, in a whole area, they'll find the most uh, controversial point at which they can attack someone. Um, no, I thought it was very encouraging. I think, I mean, what is the point of going to university unless you can have a free debate? I mean, what, in other words, if you can't, really, I mean, there are separate arguments about whether uh, undergraduates are getting good value, actually, and whether the university sector's ever expanded. I think it is. But certainly, there's no point in going unless you can have free debate, and, and we need to stick up for that as hard as we can. We, we published, uh, Rod Little drafted, and I, I sort of had a little um, redraft of something called the, the Charter for Academic Freedom, which we'd planned to actually uh, take out onto the road and we were going to launch it at Cambridge and go to Buckingham and Hull and other places and then the pandemic happened. We will do it eventually. Oh, good. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's just so important. I, I don't think there's, if, once that goes, I mean, I think, I, I think in public discourse we're, we're, we're heading to a, a, a slightly Iron Curtain situation now anyway. I think people feel very um, uh, unfree very coward uh, to, 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 to be able to speak freely. And we need to find somewhere. I think, I personally think the, the, you've got to, it's a freedom you've got to take. Yes. Actually, simple as that. Yeah, I mean, you're right. So it's a bit like you don't stop people driving cars because the odd person gets killed or, or you don't shut everything down with COVID because of, you, to reduce one, by one death. And I, and I think with freedom of speech now, you know, you, I, what I would say is you have to be able to prove uh, very proximal severe harms. Um, so for example, if you allow people to publicize a suicide on social media and, and, yes. and that leads to copycats, you know, that's hard empirical evidence for why you might not want to allow that. But um, when it comes to opinions on the Middle East political po process or immigration or whatever, I mean, you have to allow these there uh, are these debates, there were, yeah. There were always, there, were, there was always the, you know, the example, the classic example of shouting, shouting fire in the cinema, you know, and, and okay. obviously that's not free speech. Uh, and, and, but no, in all other realms, I think freedom of thought and inquiry, freedom of speech is, is, is absolutely basic. And uh, it's, it's, it's a real pity that the environment's been created. We have to try and defend it so much, but, it, but it's there. Well, but this is part of this kind of uh, what Nick Haslam calls concept creeping of terms like bullying and harassment and harm. So, so these so-called psychological harms, I think, are largely manufactured. They're not actually real. So, and, and in fact, I think if you showed psychological research where, and this is partly where I think the research needs to go, is to show that a lot of these harm claims actually rest on nothing. I mean, they've shown it with regard to trigger warnings that those things are completely useless uh, or even counterproductive. And same, same with a lot of um, other similar initiatives. But I think a lot of these harm, psychological harm claims don't rest on anything. There's, there's no study where they've tested it's it out and shown, agitation. shown these words to be harmful. No, it's people going out of their way, uh, sort of manufacturing and sensitizing and saying, that statue, you should be offended by that and you should be up in arm. You know, that's the process. It's ideologically constructed. It's not, you know, emerging from lived experience. It puts the whole canon at risk. I mean, you can't read J.S. Mill if that were the case. You know, you could, I mean, there are very few writers pre-1900 that you yeah. can read, actually. And get, you know, so no, I think it's very, very... Um, uh, it's very important we just keep on and take, take the freedom that we have and keep it, keep it. Absolutely. That needs to be a bigger thing. I'm surprised, you know, say the Conservatives haven't, haven't made this crusade for freedom or, or freedom of conscience or expression a bigger, 
part of their program. They, the Conservatives, I mean, that's a, an entirely different subject, but they, the Conservatives hasn't really, they haven't really conserved very much. And I think they've been very, very weak on the cultural stuff. I mean, most of the stuff they've just given a buy to. Um, uh, there may be a little, there's a little bit of a hint they might be getting, uh, they might politically realise what the consequences are and maybe reshaping. But the, again, I would, I would blame the, the pipeline of, um, of uh, universities to think tanks into politics means that actually there isn't, there isn't a huge difference between the, ma the, the mainstream middle of the Conservative Party and the Lib Dems and the Labour Party, really. I mean, uh, socially liberal, economically liberal, most of them. So actually, we're just not very represented, which we argue is, is one of the reasons for building something up from the grassroots that does represent the hinterland. So that's what we're trying to do. Listen, Eric, it's been, I've wanted to interview for a long time, great. and it's great that we've found time to do it, and thanks very much, and all the best. Thanks, William. That's, it's been a pleasure. Great. Thank you, Eric. Cheers. Thanks.